it is such a great pleasure to be able to be present with all of you for this very, very exciting conversation about art in the imagination with Deborah Luer and with Rowan Williams. My name is Ayla Lapine, and I'm the Amundsen Fellow in Art and Religion here at the gallery. The gallery, as many of you know, has one of the finest collections of sacred art, and I use that phrase with great care in the world. Uh, two floors above our heads, some of the finest and most beautiful things that you will ever see, regardless of what your own beliefs may be. They're profoundly moving. And introducing these two people is not only a pleasure, but it's also a gift and a privilege, especially at this stage in our festival here together. Dr. Deborah Luer is a senior lecturer in history of art at the University of Glasgow. She's a specialist in 20th century German art, particularly on Dada and Expressionism, and has a wider interest in the intersection of theology and the arts. She's published widely on modern art, culture, and politics in Germany and Switzerland, and is a visiting scholar at Sarum College, where she is an associate tutor to the MA in Theology, Imagination, and Culture. In 2007, she was a visiting lecturer at Northwestern, and in 2009 to 10, she was awarded an Alexander von Humboldt Foundation Research Fellowship. She's a regular speaker in churches and theological colleges, as well as festivals and retreats on the rich relationship between art history and faith. And she also serves on the editorial board of the Association of Art Historians Journal, Art History. Rowan Williams, Lord Williams of Oystermouth, has introduced countless audiences to the rich interdisciplinarity of theology and the arts. The former Archbishop of Canterbury and Master of Magdalen College in Cambridge wrote his doctorate at Oxford on the Russian Orthodox theologian Vladimir Losky. In 1984, he was elected Fellow and Dean of Clare College in Cambridge. And during his time at Clare, and this is available online through Magdalen, so I hope he doesn't mind me including this. During his time at Clare, he was arrested and fined for singing psalms as part of the CND protest at Lakenheath Air Base. <laughs> Let's just leave that one to hang in the air for a moment. He's been the Lady Margaret Professor of Divinity at Oxford, after which he was Archbishop of Wales, before becoming the 104th Archbishop of Canterbury. He holds honorary doctorates from more than a dozen universities, as well as being a poet and translator of poetry. His introduction to William Morris's News from Nowhere is the finest analysis of Morris's aesthetic utopia that any art historian could wish for. He speaks or reads 10 languages and learnt Russian to research and publish on the works of Dostoevsky. And he's also published studies of Arius, Teresa of Avila, Thomas Merton, and Sergei Bulgakov, together with writings on a wide range of historical and political themes. His most recent book, which I can warmly recommend, is called Looking East in Winter, Contemporary Thought and the Eastern Christian Tradition. Please join me in welcoming Deborah Luer and Rowan Williams. Oh, thank you, Ayla, so much for that um, very warm and generous introduction. It's, um, it's actually a pleasure to be introduced by you in your role as um, Amundsen Fellow for Art and Religion, because it's, um, it's actually a testament to the vital relationship between art and faith that is embodied in your person at the moment here at the National Gallery and at the role that in, in the role that you now have here. So thank you. And um, I'm feeling slightly inadequate now that I have never been arrested, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can't beat it. <laughs> <laughs> but there's always time. And... Um, it's an absolute pleasure, of course, to be um, joined here by Dr. Williams. And I just hope very much that our conversation today, ranging around a number of very diverse works of visual art, will be um, illuminating, enlightening, um, maybe it'll be challenging, who knows? Um, but I hope very much that it'll be enjoyable. We do have a time limit on what we can do this afternoon, and for that reason, um, unfortunately, I don't think we actually have time for questions at the end. We need to um, finish around quarter to five, so it's a fairly concise conversation. Um, but I hope that it will be a, um, a fascinating one for us all. So, um, Roman, you're a Welshman and you're a poet. 
Um, and you're somebody who also looks very attentively at visual art. And so I think that takes us already into the realm of the relationship between the word and the image, which is something I'd like us to explore a little bit over the next 45 minutes and to hold as a kind of red thread to our discussion. Um, and this is a painting that I know you've responded to mm -hmm. as a poet. And so um, I was wondering if you could tell us what drew you to mm -hmm. this painting by Evan Walters, the Welsh poet, uh, painter. And um, if you're willing, perhaps you'd like to read your short poem that you wrote in response mm -hmm. to the work. Thanks very much indeed, Deborah, and thank you also to Ayla for the introduction and to all of you for coming. Evan Walters isn't a very well-known artist, but he's one of the major artistic figures to come out of that actually quite rich artistic environment in Swansea in the early to mid-20th century. And I first heard of him because my best friend at school was a nephew of his, so there's a, a connection there. And in the, um, the catalogue, of an Evan Walters retrospective about 15 years ago. There's actually a portrait of my friend's mother. But I was very struck by this. It's one of um, Evan Walters's rather less experimental paintings. Some of them are very experimental indeed, playing around with um, multiple focus, a sort of blurred effect, as if um, two lenses were superimposed. But this is, is a bit more conventional. And what struck me about it was the hand that you see, which appears to be the left hand, you don't quite know exactly what's going on anywhere else. But what you see is this very um, gnarled and bony left hand exploring appropriately in the darkness. Um, the pianist in question was a real personality, a Welsh pianist. And I, I wrote this in response to the picture. Here is the left hand feeling, excavating for the supports, the left hand that in the east makes love and can't be used to eat, the left that fingers origin and dawn, the sudden opening lip across the darkness where day starts building, the left hand cupping itself around the base's fetal curl, delving inside the coils for the shell's echo, hoarse and damp. The left hand runs up and down the pillars, a hand of strings and hammers, a cat's cradle of drawn veins. This is the hand that reads at night, that touches base. You asked Deborah about the connection between word and image. And I suppose what, what I think I'm doing when I'm trying to write a poem about a work of art is to tune in to whatever shape or energy or rhythm is going on in the picture and say, well, what, what would that be in another medium? Just as the picture itself seeks for the rhythm, the, the structure within what's seen, it doesn't just reproduce, it represents. And to represent, you have to go to that level of structure and rhythm and pulse, as some people put it. So just as the visual artist is looking at, looking for, form, quarrying, excavating, as, mm -hmm. uh, and in this case, it's, it's doubled again because that looks like a picture of somebody experimenting on the keyboard, excavating. So again, in the verbal response, you excavate for that, that pulse. So I think that's, that's part of what's going on, uh, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. And it's fascinating to me to hear you um, speaking in that way about a visual image, because some of the language that you're using is actually that, you know, it's the language of touch, and it's also the, the language of, of language itself and of mm, music, mm. you know, rhythm and mm, mm. meter and structure and so on. Um, and I think it opens to us, uh, up to us more widely the sense in which artworks and images don't merely reside in, in the visual as inert objects, 
but how they can connect with us very deeply in That's right. all I, kinds of sensory I'm, I'm glad you mentioned touch, because one thing that I always find moving and striking in certain kinds of um, visual art is where you can see the tactility of a surface. We can actually see that this is something which is not a surface you're meant to ignore, but the surface itself is, is part of the work that you, you look at and engage with. And whether it's um, in terms of brushwork or in terms of the, the contours of a heavy impasto, you know, yes. you, you're looking and feeling for that yes. tactile element. And that, that kind of tactile quality, perhaps even a certain distinctive quality about impasto, since you mention it, is, is um, a characteristic of the work of another Welsh artist who, for whom I know you have a great mm. fondness, mm. Gwen John. Gwen John. What is it that draws you to the work of Gwen John? It is, I suppose, the way in which she creates a surface which, although it's, it's a flat surface, seems to carry a, a sort of density. There's a, there's a, a medium of density uh, in, in the very best, most positive sense, a sort of fog. She doesn't do bright, clear, blazing colours. She makes you see as through, as, almost as through a veil, with the light spreading, thickening yes. around a figure. And she also revisits constantly the images that she, she works with. Mm -hmm. So this is a picture of um, the foundress of a, a religious order, a Roman Catholic religious order. Gwen John was a very devout Catholic in mid and late life. And the nuns of this order asked Gwen John, would she do a nice picture for the convent, basically? Not, I think, realizing quite that Gwen John was arguably one of the best artists in Europe. <laughs> well, that, that nice Miss John does pictures. Let's ask her to do a picture for the, for the convent. Um, and there are some engravings, 17th century engravings, of Mère Pouspin, the foundress of the order. And Gwen John simply took the very simple engraving and worked it and reworked it and reworked it and reworked it, very slightly shifting the, the stance face, slightly shifting the angle and the treatment. And just as with Rembrandt self-portraits or indeed the great Impressionist sequences, it's as if that repetitive engagement says, here is something which I'm not going to get to the bottom of. Here is something on which it's worth spending indefinite time. It's always there to be revisited and explored and something fresh. Mm. And that low-key, patient revisiting, that sense that you're always looking through a kind of veil, and when you've taken the veil off, there's another veil and another veil and another veil. That's one of the things I find really compelling about mm. Gwen John's mm. painting. The most sensible thing that her brother, Augustus, ever said was that he believed Gwen John's painting would be remembered when his was forgotten. How very right he was. <laughs> but, uh, prejudice is showing there. But it is that, that sense of patience, revisiting, and an undramatic persistence in seeing, a steady seeing. The, there are other sequences like this. She loved doing these constant reworkings. There's a sequence of um, young girls in church. There are other pictures she did uh, based on the life of St. Therese of Lisieux. And of course, her evocations and re-evocations of a chair with a drape in a room by a window. Comparable, I think, to some of Van Gogh's similar treatments of ordinary bits of furniture, with the same kind of sense of the density and depth of the ordinary object mm. and the ordinary person. Yes, it's a, it's a sustained form of attention. Sustained attention, exactly that, yes. 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 And, and without great showiness yes. or yes. flashiness. Because it's, it's a way of saying that a painting belongs in a continuing relationship. It's not that when you've got it, you've got the subject, you've got the person, it's all tied up and stowed away. You haven't done, you haven't finished. Mm -hmm. And there's both an ambition and a humility in that, I think, for the painter. Yes, 
yes, humility was the word that was coming to me as mm. well, a humility in this act of constantly returning to the subject in the knowledge that it can never be fully mm. grasped, fully mm. possessed well, or, or um, complete. That's right. And that, that's a way, I think, of encoding in the painting itself the time that art takes. Mm -hmm. And I, I like that sense when I look at a painting of that it's taken appropriate time. It's one of the things about Rembrandt. It's one of the things certainly about Gwen John. You see the time that's being taken and has been taken. And you know, therefore, that it's not a moment of instantaneous capture, mm. but a, a relationship that goes, goes on moving. Do you think that relationship has something to do with artistic maturity as well? It, is it endemic to an older artist? It probably is, yes, and certainly older artists are, are often the ones who, who exhibit this revisiting, who find that they're, in one sense, their field narrows and narrows and narrows, because you, you know, this, is, this is such a, a particular and local thing, but you can't stop looking because there's always more to see. Mm. And just to touch fleetingly on the title of our conversation, something about faith has to do with that sense of an inexhaustibility mm, mm. in the world you're looking at and the person you're engaging with. The sense that there's something there that you will never come to the end of because it always belongs with or opens out onto something other than your perception mm, of that mm. instant. So looking at Mère Puspin, she's, she's looking at the artist. Um, she's also looking past the artist mm -hmm. and that's that's something which I think yeah. is significant in painting at times too. Yes, perhaps something of the infinite in the finite. Exactly, yes. that, that, that gaze is not just for you. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and that, that actually brings us on quite neatly to the, the next um, field of art that I would like to ask you about. And um, this is really to open things up a little bit further now. I think p possibly there is a very oblique connection with the Evan Walters that we started with in the poem, because um, I think a lot about the, um, the left hand that in the East makes love. <laughs> and um, even the, the phrase that the left that fingers origin the dawn, where, mm. the, where the day starts building, and I think, well, that's in the East. Mm. Um, it, maybe it's a tenuous connection, but it makes me think of your interest in Eastern mm -hmm. traditions, Eastern theological traditions, um, the uh, theology of uh, the, ortho the orthodox tradition, um, but also the visual, very rich visual traditions mm -hmm. of the East and perhaps the implications that those forms have for how we see, um, maybe from a, a Western perspective, um, if, if we come from a um, a Western context. So this is something you've written and spoken about um, quite extensively. And um, you've remarked quite often on the importance of icons in Eastern spirituality. Um, and you've responded in your poetry as well to um, icons and to other aspects of um, Byzantine art, for example, including the Pantocrata of, of Daphne. So mm. what do you find in such imagery? Mm. The icon, of course, is, is meant not to be, um, again, a reproduction of anything. It's a surface you're meant to look through because the idea is that when you look at the icon, the act of painting it is an act in which the, in this case, very literally, the energy of the persons you are representing comes through. Mm -hmm. The icon is painted by somebody who's who's saying their prayers. They are painting in a state of attentiveness, almost of contemplation. So what is painted carries that relatedness, that contemplative relatedness. So the, the flat surface of the icon is very important. It's, it's a window, it's not an object you can walk around. People have often remarked on how perspective in the icon is often reversed things converge on, on you as viewer and open out onto infinity. And if you look at the 
Rublev icon of the Trinity, that very, very famous representation, you'll see that just a glance at it, as it were, draws you in, draws the eye in towards where you are. At the same time, there's a chalice or calyx shape there, a receiving shape, whether you think of that as the chalice of the mass or the calyx of a flower, something of that is going on. There's a, a holding going on. There's also, if you look again, there's a, a circulation of lines. The, the heads of the figures constitute a sort of flow around a circle. Mm. And, and one could go on with the detail. But all of that, the, the calyx shape, the the invitation to you to occupy the, the place at the front of the table, the circulation of the heads, the gaze of the figures, all of that is meant to take you into the centre of that. And quite often in an icon you'll see, um, for example, a representation of Christ being transfigured, and behind him there'll be a blaze of light, um, a mandala of some sort of oval with spiky rays of light coming out from it, trace those to where their centre is, and you'll often find they're in Christ's belly. You might think of the Buddhist language of the hara, the, the belly from which spiritual energy flows. Um, and that's, that's a theme you find in Eastern Orthodox spirituality as well. That the, the area around the navel is where the spiritual energies kind of settle, and you have to focus your thought when you're praying. So to be drawn into the middle is not just um, where your eye is drawn, it's also in some sense where your whole responsive self is drawn. You're being invited into that mysterious and in this particular icon, dark centre. Um, and all of the shaping, the rhythm and the flow, the directionality of those images is taking you into that, that place. I'm fascinated to hear you describe it in that way, that um, sense of, of um, an inward direction, some, somehow a, a kind of force that draws mm. us in, because um, as it happens, um, something I noted from your, your poem on the, um, this extraordinary um, image mm. of the Pantocrata of Daphne, um, something I noted that you wrote in your poem in response to this um, well, it's, it's a monument, it's a, um, an applied scheme, it's an image. You wrote of his sweaty heaviness, his bulging eyes, drawn inwards to their private pain. Mm. Um, so you've got mm. something like that going on. Something like that, yes. As well, That's at least I, in your response mm. to it. That's right. I, I've always been fascinated by the way in which the Christ of this image is not looking at us. The eyes slip away as if, and I, I've written about this, other people have written about this, as if remembering mm -hmm. something internal. And when we're drawn into this image, we're drawn into that, uh, yeah, that very, again, very dark, very mysterious place. It's, it's been called by um, one or two commentators, an image of a face that has, if you like, been into darkness and back, rather like the face of Christ in Piero della Francesca's uh, resurrection, Borgo San Sepulcro. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those, those two images of the triumphant Christ are among the most powerful in the whole history of Christian art, simply because the, the face and the eyes do not engage in a kindly or benign way. Mm. They are saying to the observer, you know, death and resurrection are more serious than you could begin to imagine. Mm. Mm. And behind this is such a, a hinterland mm. Mm. of, yes, of darkness and light that uh, you, you just cannot, cannot let yourself imagine, you cannot be allowed mm. to imagine that it's easy. I think you know, compare it to um, the resurrection image that's on the um, on one of the panels of Grunewald's 
-hmm. Great, these are all to these. Um, the light. I'd, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful evocation of the blazing light in the risen body, but there's something about the sheer terror of newness, the terror of change. Um, the beauty is about the beginning of terror mm -hmm. element mm -hmm. in, in these images, which the Grunewald doesn't, doesn't come anywhere near. So that's part of why I find this such a, yeah. an overwhelming image, such a weighty image. Yes. A, a weighty image that um, uh, perhaps holds a paradox about it in that it's very, it's on the one hand a very public image, it's monumental um, public, as is the resurrection, the mm. Piero mm. resurrection in the Civic Hall yes, um, yes. fresco, and yet at the same time can speak of that private pain, to yes, use your yes. phrase. And again, something I think I noted in the poem. The book is closed. Normally, yeah. the Pantocrator would be holding an open book, but this one is slammed shut mm. and clutched mm. on his arm. That's uh, yes. significant, I think, in his way. And we're back with word and image. We're back with word and image, and how words get you to the edge of what you can't mm. say. Mm. And. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we know the words as well as he, the names Alpha Omega. It's another line from your, your poem in response to um, this work. But let's turn our attention now to another period in the history of art, one of urgent and sometimes very divisive questions of representation, questions of the role of the visual imagination in faith. Questions of, the, again, the relationship between word and image, and even questions about what art can be, mm. um, what painting is, uh, the possibilities for art. So this is the era of the Baroque, the 17th century. We're now in Rome, 17th, uh, the early 17th century in Rome, and we're with the compelling painter Caravaggio, who I know is an artist who... Um, speaks to you. Um, this is a painting by arguably the great innovator of his age, I suppose. Um, the work we're looking at at the moment, just um, if people don't know it, is, uh, in, uh, was made, it was commissioned for a small chapel off the um, Church of the French in Rome, uh, where it can still be found today. But let's think about this image, and I wonder if you could um, simply talk us through it and how we might read it, how we might respond to it, perhaps mm. theologically. Mm. Oh, goodness, yes, how long have you got? <laughs> um, it's, it gains part of its power, I think, simply from the use of light, as you'd expect, in the Baroque, mm. and the, the source of light clearly being where Christ is standing. So there is illumination coming from the figure of Christ, but it's a very odd and ambiguous illumination. It doesn't straight away solve things or sort things out. And commentators have enjoyed pointing out that we don't actually know for certain which of the figures on the left is supposed to be St. Matthew. This is the call of the Apostle Matthew. But there on that end of the painting are a group of very um, early 17th century characters <laughs> doing what they do, doing their business at the tax office. Um, now, who is the future disciple? And if you ask, well, what kind of response would be appropriate to a future disciple, you could say, I think, that all or any of those might work. Is it the person who's bent over <laughs> counting, intent on the work? Is it the person who is trying to pretend that it's somebody else that Christ is calling, doing the classic... <laughs> gesture? Is it even the, you know, the old man looking on who's semi-detached from, from it all? Any of those might be a response on the part of Matthew the tax collector to the call of Christ. And one of the things that Baroque art does at its best, and you know, this, this is pretty good, <laughs> um, is, and people don't always think this about the Baroque, it's to confuse you in a wonderfully mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. exuberant way. It's to say, there are a number of things going on here and a number of possible responses 
that, that the world could show to the mystery that's impacting upon it. So the Baroque is not just about um, oh, excess and display, certainly not just about surfaces. It's about another kind of excess, the excess of meaning, the excess of different kinds of response as, as there. And the relative darkness in which Christ stands, though the light is coming from where he is, is part of that. What's going on here? The, the summons from Christ to a human being is, yes, the pouring of light into darkness, but it's not nearly as straightforward as you might have thought from that summary. And the responses we make, evasive, um, displacing, eager, again, the chap on the right there who seems to be about to spring to his feet, is that because he's about to, to ring the police to take <laughs> Jesus into custody, or is it because he's St. Matthew about to rise up and follow? Um, excess, all these possibilities are there. And the, the painting holds all those diversities and says, well, all that's going to be going on in this moment when mm. the transcendent summons. Mm. All of it's going to be going on. Don't, don't try and um, foreclose too quickly. Don't try and settle on what, what this painting is really doing, because it's doing the whole lot. Mm. Mm. So it's an expansive and generous painting. It's an expansive and generous painting, in yes. And again, one that makes you take time. Yes. You've got to look at all this. You've got yeah. to think, well, what are they all up to? Yes. And what, what of those responses can I recognize? And how do I keep moving around them? Just as move, moving around those figures in the Rublev icon, you can move around those different responses the one springing to his feet, the one pointing away, the one focused on the money, the one semi-detached at the back, the young man sort of looking on, as wondering, all of that as part of, part of the story. And that means that in contrast to most medieval art, the sheer diversity of human response that's being depicted is part of what the painting is doing. Um, if you've got a crowd of people in a painting by Giotto or Duccio, you don't need to look at every face, in a way. Um, they're there to, to fill it out. And that's, that's no criticism, it's just that, you know, that's what they're doing. Already in um, very late medieval art, like the um, Van der Weyden Descent from the Cross, you actually do need to look at the different faces because there are lots of different sorts of grief going on. And then when you get to the full-blown Caravaggio Baroque, you, you have that sense that all those variants matter and you take the time to look and digest them all. Mm. Mm. Absolutely, and there, there seems to be an infinite sort of multitude of possible relationships in this, exactly. Exactly. implied in this, in this painting as well. And I'm struck again, as I always am when I see this painting, by the, the most infinitesimal sliver of a halo that designates yes. Christ's yes. holiness. Yes in this uh, rather dubious interior That's right. um, <clears throat> and how that um, just shines so faintly almost in contrast to these endless possibilities mm. that you've mm. been talking about and the exuberance mm. and so on. Um, now I'd like to um, take us towards the end of our conversation into our, well a little bit closer to our own era into the 20th century. Um, but remaining with images of calling, of summons, the summons of, mm. Mm. of God in a broad sense um, to uh, human beings. Um, and also for us to think a little bit about how artists in our modern era too, not just, the, uh, not just Caravaggio, not just the unknown makers of, those, uh, of the, um, the mosaic that mm. we were looking at and so on, how they challenge our seeing, um, perhaps our believing, some of those very entrenched Im images and narratives, particularly around Christmas and so on, that we're, we're all very familiar with. So you've thought a lot about the art and writing of David Jones and a painting like this, setting the Annunciation in the Welsh hills. And um, I know from um, a, a bit of conversation with you that you're also very interested 
in the work of Paul Arago, um, who is the subject, of course, as most of uh, the London audience here will know, I'm sure, of a major um, exhibition currently on at uh, Tate Britain. Um, there's a connection between Paula Rago and where we are seated in the National Gallery because uh, she was the first kind of um, an inaugural artist in residence here in 1990 and made work responding to um, some of the great masterpieces in this collection. Um, but more recently, she's created a cycle of remarkable pastel drawings, include these, including these radical reimaginings of a summons, the Annunciation, and the Nativity, a nativity unlike, uh, <laughs> unlike those we're, mo we're most used to um, right. seeing on Christmas cards and so mm. on. Mm. So can you tell us, Rowan, what you mm. see as an artist yourself and as a theologian in Paul Arago's work? Mm. Difficult to sum it up, really. I, I'm fascinated by the, the very um, eccentric, deliberately eccentric, and challenging use of light. Mm -hmm. Quite often in Paul Arrigo, you're, you're looking from a quite unexpected perspective on figures. They're often foreshortened or um, oddly isolated in their space. And the light is very much, as, as in that Annunciation, very much from the, the direct frontal perspective of of the artist. Um, and that's, that's a fascinating feature of, of the work because it's, it's as if the artist is saying, what, what you're seeing is, let's be absolutely clear, what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to pretend that um, I am, so to speak, seeing something in the light of something else. This is my my world, these are my figures that you're seeing. The light comes mm. forward. I, th I think that's, that's one of the things that's going on there. I'm also fascinated in these images especially by the, what you might call the queering of the angelic figure. Mm -hmm. um, a, an almost stereotypical Hispanic male face, um, a flounced dress, and saying something about the fact that the narrative of the Annunciation and the Nativity is, in the widest possible sense, a queering story. It's a story in which mm -hmm. issues around gender and identity and power and compliance and all sorts of other things are just rolled in together in a, in a wildly anarchic way, more than we often realize. And that, that says something highly significant about the nature of the narrative, why it continues to appeal to artists. And mm -hmm. I think also with the, um, the nativity picture, there's a very deliberate echo, isn't there, of the pieta. So instead of the, the mature virgin with the dead Christ draped mm. over her knee, you have the angels supporting mm. a, you know, a, a Mary who almost looks at the end of her, of her life and is, is blood-stained. And again, a, a deliberate <laughs> messing with your theological mind here. You're, <laughs> you're, you're invited to think right outside theological and representational boxes mm -hmm. to expose yourself to something of the the strangeness of the narrative and the strangeness of the image that's there. So going back to, to what we were saying right at the start of this discussion, the work of art seeks to tune in to the pulses and the rhythms of a, a scene or a narrative or a theme. And sometimes what it can most effectively do for us is to make us understand just how disruptive, just how strange those pulses are. And I think that's one of the things I, I sense in, mm. in Paul Arrigo's paintings on, on these themes. And it's, it's very different from the way in which David Jones handles it in that mm. lovely, lovely picture, the Cavalache um, Vair, Mary in the, the Welsh hill setting. As always with David Jones, the detail is 
almost unmanageably precise and finicky. You, you look at all the small birds in that picture, all of them, the native Welsh, well, not native Welsh birds, but you know, birds you will see in the countryside in Wales. Mm -hmm. There's the, um, the wattle fence around Mary, the garden enclosed. There's the Brecon Beacon's background. There's the angel dressed as a deacon at mass because he's announcing the gospel, um, as the deacon does at mass. So Jones is doing what he always does, which is in an apparently fairly um, flat surface. He's layering very delicately, very skillfully. Mm. The natural world, the, the world of the mountains and the bird song, the cultural world of Mary within the enclosed space of cultivation and domesticity, mm. the ecclesiastical world of the proclamation of the gospel in church, the political world, the angel is carrying a sword, which is a very unusual theme, but of course speaks also not only of the sword of power, but the sword that will pierce Mary's heart, theological and spiritual, all of these layered by line rather than dimensionality, which is one of the things that Jones does. He, he complicates and tangles and knits his lines everywhere, so that in this apparently flat image, you, you have a sort of depth of reference just by following all the things he's doing with the different corners of the linear representation. So a very different exercise from Paul Arrego. But again, I think saying, here's a, a story which you can at one level see as um, a pleasingly sentimental semi-fairy tale. The angel came and told Mary she was going to have a baby. And the harder you look at it, the more the echoes spin away and the more the resonances are set up and you're in a kind of hall of mirrors where the images keep coming. Mm -hmm. And that's Jones's way, I think, of doing what Rego's doing mm -hmm. in um, making us see the strangeness of what's going on here, the, mm -hmm. the odd harmonics of this story. Yes, it's, a, it, it's like boundless possibilities of the, the boundless Again, possibilities. Again, we're, we're back to time-taking, aren't we? And we're back to mm. the inexhaustibility of what this is seeking to represent. Yes. And that's, that's what is one of the things, anyway, that is religious about imagination, that sense of not having done with what's there yes. and not knowing what's around the corner of your vision and always moving steadily to, to adjust that corner and finding more and more vistas and taking more and more time. Yes. Well, thank you, Rowan, so much. I, I wish we could carry on talking because I would just um, love to hear you say more about um, art. I've been um, <laughs> wondering what, um, what it would have been like if you had been called not to the church but to the study of art history. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps we won't speculate. I think I might have had a quieter life. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you've certainly enriched our um, appreciation of art history and I think given us such a, a wonderful and uh, fitting conclusion to this um, festival of art history um, organised for the first time by the Association of Art Historians. And I just really want to... Um, Thank you, I hope on behalf of everyone, for your generosity in sharing with us um, so eloquently your responses to art, in showing us the plenitude and the abundance of possibilities around art making and the viewing of art and how it can be um, something that takes us in to um, endless possibilities for our own imaginations as well as inviting us into a relationship with the imagination of the artist. So thank you for doing well, that you, for us. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you very much indeed. And, um, and thank you to um, the National Gallery for hosting this wonderful event. Um, I'm very, I, I want to um, also thank the Association of Art Historians and Greg Perry, who's here, our CEO, for inviting me to be involved, even though it did mean getting up at half past three in the morning in Glasgow to come here. But um, 
it's been absolutely worth it, and um, let's show our appreciation, please. <laughs>